Welcome to the accessibility orientation for the VA.gov platform. My name is Brian DeConnick, and I am the accessibility specialist for the platform governance team. Uh, if you've already watched the general orientation video for VA.gov platform, you know something about uh, the governance team, collaboration cycle, the processes that we use to uh, review the things built and launched on VA.gov. Um, I would recommend watching that video either before you watch the rest of this one or right after you watch this one. I'm going to reference some things uh, from the collaboration cycle. Um, that might not make any sense if you uh, haven't already watched general orientation. Um, so that's just a brief prerequisite. But otherwise, let's uh, dive in here. Um, so this is the title slide for the accessibility orientation. And there are three screenshots and sort of a collage arrangement of uh, screenshots of different products on va.gov par or parts of them <laughs> with, um, <laughs> excuse me, we're off to a great start. I'm going to take a sip of water and try again. Okay, so we have three screenshots of parts of products on va.gov that have been annotated to show accessibility information. Um, this is one of the tools and techniques that we will go over in the course of the presentation. Just a little sneak preview of the kind of work that we do for VA. So let's talk about the agenda for today's presentation. Uh, we're going to start with an introduction to accessibility, just what it is, why we care about it, why it matters. We'll talk about the laws, standards, and strategies for accessibility work. Um, this is sort of the rules that we have to follow and where they come from. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. We'll talk about tools and techniques and other ways of doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we'll go over the foundational testing that your team is required to do as part of the collaboration cycle, as part of our assessment process, review process for the things you build. And throughout the whole thing, we'll talk about your homework. Um, so uh, when I say homework, you don't need to be scared. You don't have to turn anything in. I'm not going to grade anything. But this is just extra reading, extra resources that hopefully will give you a fuller picture of um, how accessibility works at VA, some of the techniques that we use, the reason why we use them, and uh, hopefully, um, <clears throat> yeah, just extra insight that you find useful in your work. Um, this is an honor system thing, self-paced, self-guided, but the homework is worth your time. Definitely follow through, read all the things, all that. So a link to this recording is on platform website. And uh, it's also posted in the bookmarks bar for the accessibility help channel in Slack. <clears throat> this is the first time in the presentation that I am mentioning the accessibility help channel in Slack. Um, it will not be the last time. It's going to come up a few times. It's a great resource. And I would really, really encourage everybody to pause this video, go join the accessibility help channel, and come right back. Uh, but like I said, I'll remind you a few more times over the course of the presentation. I'll also mention that uh, everything that is linked in the slides um, that I'm presenting should also be linked in the description of the YouTube video. So if there is a resource that you want to follow um, to uh, to read more or learn more, uh, just look in the description. You should be able to find all of those links. OK, <clears throat> so with that, let's talk about the introduction to accessibility. What is this? Why does it matter? I know that a lot of people who are watching this video who are new to the VA.gov project, um, <clears throat> a lot of you have worked in uh, government before or worked in industry and in roles that have required good accessibility practices, but some of you maybe haven't. Um, for some people, this might be the first project or the first job that you've ever had where accessibility is something that they talk about on day one. <clears throat> so let's get into what it is and why it matters. Um, we'll start with some definitions. Accessibility is the practice of ensuring that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. And when we say people with disabilities can use them, what we mean is perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with whatever it is that we're putting on the website. Assistive technology is another term that you may hear or may have heard before. 
So assistive technology is a tool that helps someone with a disability complete a task. In a digital context, the go-to example is screen reader software. You may have heard of this before. You may have seen this demoed before. Um, screen reader software is software that will read out loud to the user all of the text and all of the other elements on the web page. Um, that way, if you cannot see the screen, you know what's there. You know how, what you can do to interact with the web, the website, interact with whatever tools are there. Um, but that is not the only assistive technology. Uh, there are a lot of assistive technologies that help people with disabilities in lots of contexts. A wheelchair is a, an assistive technology. A hearing aid is an, an assistive technology. Uh, you may have seen sip and puff devices, which can be used for operating a computer, but can also be used for operating other things as well. Um, and then just the definition, a tool that helps someone with a dis disability complete a task can be read very, very broadly. Um, we can say that somebody who wears eyeglasses is somebody who uses an assistive technology or contact lenses. Um, now, somebody who wears glasses may not self-identify as a person with a disability, but nevertheless, they are an assistive technology user. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, actually. Uh, and then when we think about how people with disabilities use technology, use the computer, use the web, um, web accessibility encompasses all disabilities that are going to affect how you access the web. And I am going to make the bold claim that every disability that you could possibly think of in some context or some situation impacts the way somebody might use a website or use a computer. So that includes auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speech, and visual disabilities. All right, so those are your definitions. Those are the core concepts. Um, <clears throat> but you might ask this very natural question, how many veterans, the people that we're serving with VA.gov, how many veterans have a disability? I'm going to give you three different answers because they're sort of, well, there are many ways of answering that question. I'll give you three of them. Um, so the first number I'm going to give is 27% of veterans have a service-connected disability. Service-connected means that they have gone through some sort of exam, either a medical exam or some other sort of process um, <clears throat> to, that has determined that uh, a medical condition that they have um, is the direct result of something that occurred during the course of their service for a country. Um, so 27% of veterans uh, have a service-connected disability. If we look just at post-9-11 veterans, that number jumps up to 43% with a service-connected disability. Uh, you might be wondering, why is the number so much bigger? Um, it has, <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons. Um, it has to do with advances in medical technology. Um, survival rates in conflicts are much higher than they used to be, but uh, many of those uh, survivors um, have, have injuries that resulted in long-term or permanent disabilities. Um, <clears throat> that number is also bigger because we're just better at measuring disability than we used to be, especially when we think about cognitive disabilities, um, uh, trauma experiences, things like that. Um, in previous conflicts and past conflicts, those are things that weren't always measured with the same rigor or the same sensitivity as uh, we have now. And so both of those numbers are for service-connected disabilities, but a veteran's life continues after they end their military service, and uh, people can acquire disabilities in lots of ways, either through an injury or through an illness, or just through their body aging and things about their body changing. Um, so if we take away the service-connected part and just look at all veterans, 40% of veterans self-report having a disability. And that compares to about 20% of the general population self-reporting having a disability, the general population of the United States, I should say. Um, <clears throat> so approximately twice the ratio for veterans. That number comes from an American community survey uh, conducted by the Census Bureau. Um, and the researchers who are watching this uh, should immediately pick up on this sort of key phrase, self-report. Um, there's stigma around disability in our culture. And some people uh, 
who may be experiencing a disability would not say that, would not acknowledge that in a Census Bureau survey form. Um, <clears throat> it, sometimes it's very difficult to acknowledge that something about your body has changed, uh, something that used to be easy for you is now more difficult. Um, sometimes it's very hard to acknowledge that something that your neighbor or your friend can do is something that you cannot do. Um, and so when you think about that stigma around disability, uh, that might mean that that 40% number is an underestimate. And likewise for the general population, that 20% number is an underestimate. Um, <clears throat> it might also mean that when we think about how our users interact with VA.gov, we can't rely on our users to choose like the version or the um, sort of uh, variation on a web page or on a tool that is intended for people with certain types of disability. Not everybody will recognize that or choose to recognize that in themselves. So we really need to design for everybody. And we'll talk about that along the way as well. So all of this leads to this other question that maybe popped up in your head as you were listening to me talk about all this, which is what even is a disability? Um, and that is a big, big question that books have been written about um, I'm spending a slide on it. So what even is a disability? Uh, I'm going to go over two ways of thinking about disability. The first one is the medical model of disability. So the medical model focuses on an individual and the functions of their body. It identifies disability as a diagnosis um, focused on curing, mitigating, or managing a medical condition. So this is a lot of the time what I would say most people in my experience think of disability as is you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you have this condition and we can uh, give you medicine or we can perform surgery or we can't. And instead you need to use some other kind of tool or assistive technology to help mitigate or manage your condition. <clears throat> The medical model is also where this idea of uh, service-connected disability comes from. The idea that in the course of your military service, um, you uh, you experience something, um, some sort of injury or illness or something like that, and a doctor has determined you, that you have a disability. Um, the medical model is very useful. Uh, it is a very useful model in certain contexts for understanding disability. But I would like, uh, in our accessibility work, I would like you to think about disability in a different way, and that is the social model of disability. <clears throat> so the social model focuses on systemic barriers that are disabling to individuals. So in this model, disabilities are generated by assumptions about capabilities required for processes, tools, or social settings. So what does that mean? That is a confusing set of sentences. Uh, basically, what this means is that there is nothing about a person that makes that person disabled. What makes somebody experience a disability <clears throat> is not being able to accomplish a task. Um, and them not being able to accomplish a task is our fault, the fault of the people who are designing and building the thing that they needed to interact with. Um, so in the physical world, we can imagine that as uh, making a building that doesn't have a ramp and does have stairs. Um, that is a disabling experience. We have created a barrier that creates a disability for somebody who uses a wheelchair. <clears throat> it's also a disabling experience for other people too. It's a disabling experience for um, somebody who is pushing a stroller and they can't abandon their baby outside the building, but they need to get in somehow. It's a disabling experience for somebody who's carrying a really heavy box and if you've tried to climb up stairs carrying a really heavy box, it is not easy. Um, so the social model of disability shifts the focus away from the person who is uh, trying to use the thing we're building. It shifts the focus away from the idea that we need to provide individual accommodations or a special version for certain people. <clears throat> and instead, it makes it our responsibility. Um, so the social model of disability helps us think about disability in terms of mismatched UX interactions, mismatched ex experience interactions, where we thought people would be able to do 
this thing would have this capability. And in the real world, people have a much broader set of capabilities and sometimes a much narrower set of capabilities um, <clears throat> for, uh, for interacting with the thing that we built. Um, the main takeaway from accessibility work is people are complicated. And uh, sometimes um, the assumptions that you hold on to for how somebody will use a website, they don't really hold up. <clears throat> so social model disability makes it our job to, uh, whoops, just punched my microphone. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the social model of disability makes it our job to think about and build for everybody rather than making it the job of the person who's coming to va.gov to figure out how to use our, our tools. So that is a lot to hold on to. Like I said, many books have been written on this topic, <clears throat> um, but let's just sort of narrow it down to just a handful of things to remember. The first thing to remember is that not all people with disabilities use assistive technology. Um, not all assistive technology users have disabilities. I mentioned um, uh, eyeglasses as an example of an assistive technology that people um, that people might use, but they don't think of themselves as having a disability. I'll also mention um, text messaging. So SMS text messaging on cell phones started out as an assistive technology, as uh, a way for um, people who are deaf or hard of hearing to communicate using their uh, cell phone. If you are not deaf or hard of hearing, but you are sending text messages to people, you're using an assistive technology. And then uh, not all people with disabilities self-identify as having a disability. So that, again, gets into the stigma questions, um, gets into um, <clears throat> what does it mean to have a disability? That's a very personal question. Um, and again, like that place where different models of understanding disability um, can lead to sort of different results. But the main takeaway as we build things is that we don't know very much about the VA.gov user who's coming to, um, to the website. We don't know if they use a keyboard. We don't know if they use a mouse. <clears throat> we don't know if they use a touch screen. We don't know if they use a screen reader or screen magnification software voice command software, or any other alternative input device. We don't really know anything about them. Uh, tools like Google Analytics, they don't capture assistive technology use, and they don't really capture <clears throat> interaction patterns that would point clearly to different types of disability. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's a really good thing because there are privacy implications. If we were tracking um, people's disabilities through Google Analytics, that would raise some concerns. Um, <clears throat> but the fact is we just don't have any reliable or useful way of gathering any of this data. So we don't know a lot about our users. We can't make very many assumptions. And we'll come back to this a little later. <clears throat> okay, so now let's move on to the laws, standards, and strategies of accessibility. So. I'm not going to go into detail with any of the uh, the rules that we have to follow. Um, I would encourage you to explore these a little bit along the way. Um, so the first one is Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This requires that all information and communication technology developed, procured, maintained, or used by the federal government is accessible. Um, <clears throat> developed, procured, maintained, or used by the federal government is very, very broad. Um, so Section 508 means that the websites that we build and the web applications and the mobile apps and all that uh, that are aimed towards a veteran audience or uh, their families or the general public for that matter, all of that has to be accessible. Uh, but it also means any internal tools have to be accessible. It means presentations, like the presentation you're watching right now, has to be accessible. Um, it means that uh, anything used in a therapeutic context in VA medical centers needs to be accessible. Um, <clears throat> it's just a very broad uh, mandate for accessibility. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a... Um, fantastic piece of legislation from the early 90s governing um, <clears throat> governing accessibility or accessibility and uh, disability rights in the United States. Um, 
the ADA applies to both the public sector and the private sector, but in the context of information technology, Section 508 is a much more uh, powerful, much stronger uh, set of rules. <clears throat> so when you hear people talking about accessibility in government context, we very rarely mention the ADA, and we much more frequently mention Section 508. <clears throat> the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which you will hear me pronounce with the abbreviation WCAG, pronounced as WCAG, um, there's a missing vowel, but you just got to trust me, WCAG, uh, these are an international standard maintained by the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C, which defines minimum requirements for accessible websites. So if you're not familiar, the W3C is like the non-governmental governing board or governing body for the web. Um, they define lots of different standards. They define standards around how browsers are supposed to interpret HTML code. They define standards around how um, servers are supposed to communicate with each other. Um, and they define and maintain these standards around accessible content on websites. Um, <clears throat> so these are the minimum requirements for accessibility. And I really want to emphasize minimum here. <clears throat> we can always aim for a better experience than just the minimum. These are rules that um, it's helpful for you to learn some of them. You don't need to learn all the deep depths of everything. Um, <clears throat> in, um, in accessibility work, like it's really more important that I know all the details about WCAG than it is that you know all the details about WCAG. Instead, what I want you to learn really well are the VA.gov experience standards. So these standards synthesize WCAG and other guidance around information architecture and design and uh, content and all of these other factors that go into the things that you build, um, all of these practice areas. VA.gov experience standards synthesize all of that into standards for all products that launch on VA.gov. Um, so these are the rules that we expect you all to follow. Uh, there are much fewer but they are broader than WCAG. So where WCAG is very technical guidance, uh, the VA.gov experience standards are more of like a, a holistic, um, is this a good experience and an experience that makes sense for veterans and other users coming to VA.gov. So I would definitely, definitely encourage you to follow the link in the description section of this YouTube video and, um, <clears throat> and read the VA.gov experience standards and become familiar with them. Um, as you receive feedback from my team, uh, the governance team at Staging Reviews, which is one of the reviews in the collaboration cycle process, um, <clears throat> we will reference these experience standards as uh, part of those findings, as part of the, part of the uh, issues that we lost. And then finally, I want to highlight the modernized VA.gov accessibility strategy. So this outlines our beyond compliance approach to building accessible products. Again, WCAG defines minimum requirements. We want to aim higher than that. We want a good experience for everybody who visits VA.gov. And that includes a lot more than just meeting minimums. So the goals and the strategy behind that are outlined in the uh, modernized VA.gov accessibility strategy document. Um, this is, again, not, not a document that you need to learn deeply. Um, <clears throat> it's something that you might want to read once or twice to uh, sort of get a sense of the philosophy behind the work that we're doing. <clears throat> OK, so that's a lot of rules. What do you really need to know? And here are the sort of three main things. Our core goal in all the accessibility work that we do here is that all veterans can access VA benefits and services independently. Nobody should have to um, <clears throat> need to call the help desk. Nobody should have to need to work with a caregiver or a family member or somebody like that just to access a VA benefit. Uh, all veterans using VA.gov to access services should be able to do that independently using whatever tools and assistive technologies are right for them. <clears throat> your team, the VFS team that you're working with, is responsible for ensuring that your product is accessible. So that's your job. You got to make sure it's accessible, but you're not on your own. 
Uh, I'm here to help. There are a bunch of other accessibility specialists to help. And there's a vast body of knowledge that has emerged as we've been working on VA.gov um, that we usually are pretty good at documenting and sharing um, as you do your work. <clears throat> and then finally, the VA.gov experience standards will help keep you on the right track. So get to know those standards. Um, <clears throat> so that actually brings us to our very first homework assignment. Review the VA.gov experience standards on platform website. Um, <clears throat> these experience standards, again, they are sort of broadly uh, defined holistic standards for the veteran experience, um, but they are informed by WCAG, they are informed by accessibility best practices, and um, and I think you will find that they all make a lot of sense. They are all very intuitive and straightforward and good goals to try to meet. Okay, so I mentioned you're not on your own. Let's talk about the places you can go to uh, get help. Uh, your team may already have a dedicated accessibility. Uh, oh, look, there's a grammar area in the slide. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> your team may already have a dedicated accessibility specialist supporting you. Um, so if you do have an accessibility specialist on your team, find them and get to know them. They want to be your best friend. I want to be your best friend too, but I work with a lot of people. If you've got somebody on your team, get to know them, uh, have a coffee chat or a lunch chat or something like that with them um, and ask them how they approach their work, uh, what you need to know, things like that. <clears throat> if you don't have an accessibility specialist on your team, or even if you do, all teams can request support from the Sitewide Content Accessibility and Information Architecture team, which we usually call Kaya. Um, so Kaya, uh, right there in the name, covers multiple practice areas, content, accessibility, and information architecture. And the accessibility folks who work on that team are really great, really smart, dedicated people. Um, they are working with a lot of teams, so they may not have the time to get to know you the same way as somebody who's dedicated to your team is, but they will do their darndest. They will work really hard to get to know you and uh, help you build your product. In addition to getting help from Kaya, you can always ask questions in the accessibility help channel in Slack. I monitor that channel. A bunch of other people do too. You got a lot of a lot of uh, thoughtful people who have accessibility experience, um, even if their job title doesn't say anything about accessibility, who are watching that channel and are eager to jump in and help out. And then for process related questions, especially when we get to things like the foundational testing, which will be later in the presentation, you can always come and ask questions at collaboration cycle office hours. Um, these are office hours that are um, hosted by the governance team every Wednesday if you uh, if you're curious about how all the pieces fit together. I'll also mention um, in the design orientation uh, they talk about design office hours and I usually like to sit in on those too because you never know when something interesting might happen in design office hours. <clears throat> so if you have accessibility questions probably bring this to the design office hours too and um, count on me being there. Okay, so those are some resources for getting help. Uh, you'll notice that I mentioned that accessibility help channel in Slack, and if you haven't joined it yet, now's a great time to pause the presentation and join it now. Okay. So let's talk about how we actually do this work, the tools and techniques of accessibility. So uh, several slides ago, I left off with some things to remember. Not all people with disabilities use assistive technology. Not all assistive technology users have disabilities. Not all people with disabilities self-identify as having a disability. And all these things that we don't know about a VA.gov user, about the technology and the tools that they use to uh, access VA.gov. So how do you make something accessible when you don't know anything about your users? Um, and so that's where the social model of disability comes in. So remember that disabilities in this model are generated by assumptions that we're making about the capabilities required for processes, tools, or social settings. So <clears throat> when we are making bad assumptions or overly broad assumptions, we are creating disabilities. We're creating disabling conditions. So we make things accessible by questioning those assumptions, uh, the assumptions we make about our users, and by thinking critically about our design choices and writing code that works for all user agents and all input devices that is as broadly compatible with things as possible. 
So what does that actually mean on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, the first tool or technique is sort of a conceptual technique. Um, <clears throat> it's called shift left. If you've done any accessibility work or you've followed the community at all, you have heard people say shift left more times than you can probably count. Um, so this is thinking about accessibility early and often throughout your product life cycle. If you imagine the life cycle of your product as a timeline where at the all the way on the right end of the timeline is your product launch and uh, the press releases that VA that, that the VA is going to release all about this new thing that you've just built and um, I don't know the Secretary of Veterans Affairs gets to give a press conference and mention this cool cool thing that you all built. Um, I don't know, hopefully somebody from your company buys you pizza, you know, all these great things that happen at the end of your project. That's at the very right end of your timeline. All the way at the left end of your timeline is the point at which people come up with like the problem statement. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to solve for? Why does this matter? <clears throat> What's our approach to solving this, this, this or answering these questions? Um, so you've got this timeline that covers the whole life cycle of your product. <clears throat> and if we start at the right end and slowly move left, uh, prior to launch, there are QA steps. Um, there are the things that you do to prepare your product for launch. And those QA steps traditionally include accessibility testing. And the problem with that traditional approach is that if you're testing for accessibility right before you launch the product and you find problems, <clears throat> then you are all of a sudden kind of in a sticky situation because either you have to delay the product launch to go back and fix everything, or you are launching a product that has known accessibility issues and you just sort of know that you're launching something that's not going to work for everybody. And that's not a situation you want to, um, to find yourself in. <clears throat> so... Shift left is about moving accessibility further and further and further and further left in the timeline. And that doesn't mean so you don't have to do any QA testing. Um, you still want to do accessibility at that point at the end. You still want to test. But hopefully, if you've been doing things right, if you've been shifting left all through the process, um, you won't find anything in that QA step. And you won't have that sort of launch time drama around accessibility. So what does it mean to shift left? That means um, uh, thinking about accessibility as you're writing code, thinking about accessibility as you're conducting user research, thinking about accessibility as you're making wireframes as a designer, thinking about accessibility as a product manager, I'm looking at you product managers, <laughs> um, as you write your user stories and your acceptance criteria, as you write your definition of done for all the things that you're asking your team to do. Uh, accessibility should be a part of everything. It's everybody's job and not just the job of one person at the end or not even just the job of the engineers who are building, not the job of the designers. Everybody has to work on accessibility. Um, that makes it all go much, much smoother. Um, so make accessibility a part of your user, a part of your user stories and acceptance criteria at every step. Um, I also recommend that you attend the Veteran Digital User Experience Weekly Design Sync. That is a a lot of words for what people refer to as like the design meeting or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so this is a weekly meeting that happens um, where different teams showcase what they've been working on. Um, reminders are posted every Monday in the design channel in Slack. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and in that meeting, it's not always accessibility content, but it frequently is accessibility content or it's some sort of design work or some sort of research that involves accessibility in some way. So you can learn a lot about what other teams are doing and come up with ideas for shifting left just by attending that meeting on a regular basis and getting a chance to see the broader landscape for VA.gov. <clears throat> um, and then the other thing I'll mention for shifting left is to just ask questions in the accessibility help channel in Slack. See, I'm mentioning that channel again, and I'm actually giving it to you as a homework assignment here. You should go join that channel in Slack. Um, so yeah, that that channel is a great place to ask for advice. Like, how do I move this earlier in my process? Um, does anybody have any tips, tricks, approaches for doing that? And uh, people will definitely jump in and answer.
And the next technique uh, that we will mention is making your research inclusive. Um, so basically, like I said earlier, humans are complicated. And just like any other design choices or design approaches, you need to validate, test and validate your accessibility choices with real live actual humans. Um, uh, VA.gov uh, works with a company called uh, Perigean, I think. Gosh, I'm never sure if it's Perigean or Perigean. Um, I should know by now. <laughs> so this company, Perigean, I will say, um, <clears throat> they are uh, a company that we work with to recruit participants. We recruit and compensate actual veterans to test our products and give us useful re user research insights into the things we're building. Um, one thing that I would like you to remember as a researcher or anybody who might be involved in research is that a lot of the uh, approaches that we use for UX research involving like uh, Figma prototypes or things like that, a lot of those approaches don't always work for people with disabilities or for assistive technology users. Um, in particular, a lot of a lot of assistive technologies just don't work with Figma prototypes. <clears throat> um, Figma is doing some really good work on making their prototypes more accessible, but um, at least at the time of this recording, I would not count on that. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes you might need to do a little bit of extra work as you design your research study um, to either create an, an assistive technology friendly prototype or to just use a different approach for some participants. There have been research studies <clears throat> where prototypes aren't working, but the researchers are able to pivot to um, more of an interview or like a um, like a tabletop exercise approach or something like that and still get some really good information out of assistive technology users or users with disabilities. Um, so that's something where you want to think about that. And then I'll also just mention um, this falls very much under the umbrella of accessibility, which is as you do your research, you want to conduct uh, trauma-informed research that keeps participants safe. So trauma-informed research, the reality of the population that we work with is that um, many veterans have had significant experiences in their lives. Um, it is a, an understatement. And um, sometimes it's necessary to ask them <clears throat> about those experiences. Sometimes as they are talking to you about something, uh, the conversation will naturally turn to one of those experiences, even if you don't really expect it to. Um, so you want to make sure that you have the right strategies in place to keep your participants safe, to um, uh, help them end the task, exit the session, and sometimes even get help if it's necessary. Um, so <clears throat> make sure you, if you're in any way involved with research, make sure you're familiar with these trauma-informed research guidelines. Um, <clears throat> I'll also, just not on the slide, but I'll briefly plug the Kaya team, which is one of the help resources mentioned earlier. Um, the Kaya team has a lot of experience assisting with uh, assistive technology research sessions. So um, sometimes there's some technology troubleshooting for getting uh, getting a screen reader to read out properly for somebody's screen sharing with Zoom or something like that. And, uh, and there are some folks who have gotten really good at helping with that. So uh, as needed, definitely turn to the, the our friends in Kaya to help out with that. Um, and uh, I would also recommend my two homework items here. Uh, join the Inclusive Research channel in Slack. Inclusive Research, excuse me, Inclusive Research is more than just accessibility research, but accessibility is a big part of it. And then I would encourage people to read the Accessible Prototyping with CodePen article um, <clears throat> that we have on platform website. Um, there are some teams that have done some really good work on building these assistive technology friendly prototypes that um, can be used for conducting research studies. <clears throat> okay, so researchers, that's on you. Now let's talk to the designers. So I would like you all to design for multiple modes of interaction. 
um, at this point in this modern era of web design, pretty much everybody is on board with the idea that you should design responsive interfaces that work on desktop, on tablet, on mobile, all of that. I want you to expand that concept to other devices and other technologies and other modes of interaction. You know, you should constantly be asking yourself, what would this interaction be like if I used a screen reader? If I only used my voice? If I only used a mouse or if I couldn't use a mouse? <clears throat> so all of these are questions that you should ask yourself um, and they can lead you to some sort of interesting design choices and interesting places. Um, for screen reader software, uh, <clears throat> you experience a web page in a different way than a, a sighted person might experience a web page. Um, so screen readers read things out in an order. There is a first item on a page and a second and a third and a fourth, rather than um, a sighted user maybe looking around the page and jumping around based on what they're seeing. Um, and so you have to start thinking about the sequencing of content and um, does it make sense in the order in which you have it? And likewise, when you're thinking about things like voice, now all of a sudden you need to think about pronounceability. If somebody's trying to click on a link, is the word easy to say? Um, these are all the sorts of questions that you start to think about. And the thing I wanna emphasize is you don't have to have the answers. Uh, it's totally okay if you ask a question and you're like, I don't know, what this interaction model looks like. I don't know how this works. Uh, the important thing is you're asking these questions, you're making a good faith effort to design for them. And here's the next bullet point. You annotate your work with accessibility information and questions. So <clears throat> we started the uh, presentation with the title, or, uh, uh, yeah, title slide with some screenshots of accessibility annotations. The uh, design system website for va.gov has a really fantastic article on accessibility annotations uh, as you build for va.gov applications um, with both sort of practical tips and sort of conceptual what would we want to annotate questions. Um, <clears throat> but just sort of summarizing, why would you want to annotate? It helps me as the person reviewing your work at various points in the collaboration cycle, it helps me understand your design choices. If you have done something for a reason, if you've tried to design for a screen reader user or for a voice user or for a keyboard user, um, <clears throat> I want to understand what led you to that conclusion and either give you a gold star for making the right choice or give you a course correction if you're not quite right. Because again, you're, sometimes you're not going to be right. Sometimes I'm not right either. People are complicated. Um, but it's it's an opportunity to sort of uh, create a dialogue between you as a designer and me as a reviewer, and also with any other accessibility specialist who might be working with you over the course of um, your product lifecycle. And the other thing annotations help with is uh, they help your engineers faithfully build the thing that you've designed. Um, sometimes there have been situations where a designer designs something with um, really thoughtful screen reader interactions in mind, but it's not annotated, it's not clearly documented, and the engineers maybe don't understand what the intention was and they build something that's not quite right. Um, so it's a, annotations are a method of communication. They're a way of making sure that I know what's going on in your head and your engineers know what's going on in your head too. Okay, so that's your homework for this slide is read the accessibility annotations article. I'm going to uh, stay on the designers, but Honestly, the engineers and everybody else should listen to this too. Uh, get to know the VA, the VA design system. I mentioned this on the previous slide, but you should just go check it out right now, design.va.gov. Um, it is a collection of uh, patterns and templates and components and a content style guide. It's got a lot, a lot of really good stuff all about how we build things for the VA. Um, each component is rigorously tested for accessibility and for other things too. Um, and each page about each component may contain additional information, additional accessibility uh, considerations that you should be aware of and check um, as, you, uh, as you build things using those uh, components. <clears throat> I also just wanna highlight that many of the patterns that are in the patterns section 
have been deeply, deeply researched with assistive technology users. Um, I just want to flag three that I particularly like. The pattern asks users for a single response, which we all often call one thing per page. Ask users for multiple responses, which we often call list and loop. And ask users for their relationship to the veteran, which has some really good stuff in there about um, conditionally revealed fields and things like that. Um, so those are three patterns that I particularly like, but the whole design system website is really, really good. Get to know the design system. Um, it's going to be your best friend. I also want to be your best friend. You're going to end up with lots and lots of friends. <clears throat> uh, one more for the designers. And again, this is sort of for everybody, which is mobile first design. Um, so that is starting with the smallest form factor and designing up. Um, this is, again, hopefully not a controversial idea in modern era of web design and development, but um, just to give you the numbers backing it up, approximately 50% of all VA.gov traffic is on mobile devices. And I say approximately 50% because I think there are different ways of measuring and because I have not seen the most recent number, so I don't know what the actual precise number is. But a lot of people are visiting VA.gov on their mobile devices for a particularly uh, relevant accessibility angle to this, I just want to point out that mobile devices are often the primary device or even the only device for some veterans with disabilities. So some disabled veterans, especially blind veterans, and especially younger blind veterans, um, they only have a smartphone. A, a modern iPhone or a modern Android device is a pretty powerful computer. Uh, the only thing it doesn't have is a big screen but if you are blind, maybe that is not as important to you. Um, and iOS and Android both have built-in screen readers that are pretty good screen readers and really robust gesture control for controlling the screen for interacting with elements. And so um, uh, thinking about blind veterans in particular, um, some of the first, assist first assistive, <clears throat> excuse me, whoo, some of the first assistive technologies that they learn how to use are these accessibility features on their phone. Um, so a lot of people are only accessing VA.gov using their mobile device. Um, the reason this matters is because every now and then you might run into a situation where you think, well, this is such a complicated process that I'm designing for. No one would ever do this on their phone when they're out and on the go. They would only ever do it when they are sitting at a desk working on their laptop or on their desktop or something. And that is an assumption that you just can't make. Um, it's uh, it's something where you really need to make sure you're designing for um, the, the person who, uh, yeah, they might be sitting down to complete the process because it's a lot to do when you're on the go, but they might be doing it on their phone still or on a tablet or something like that. So everything needs to work on mobile, mobile first design all the way. All right, so I'm looking at you now, engineers. You thought you had it easy. I want you to write semantic HTML. So for anybody who is unfamiliar with that term, um, semantic HTML it is, it is the cornerstone of accessible ap applications. Um, semantic HTML is the idea that uh, HTML, the language of web pages, has a combination of semantic and non-semantic elements. And the semantic elements are things that have a meaning associated with them. So the button element is for buttons. The um, all of the heading elements, elements h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, h6, h6, those headings all have a meaning associated with them. And then there are non-semantic elements that don't have any meaning that you can just sort of do whatever you want with them. So those are your divs and your spans, things like that. Um, with modern tools like JavaScript and certain JavaScript frameworks, especially, you can do whatever you want with those non-semantic elements, like really whatever you want. You can make a div or a span into a button or into a link or into a heading. Uh, and I'm asking you to not do that. <laughs> so I, whenever there's an appropriate semantic element, again, we'll use that button example. Um, I want you to use that appropriate element to build the thing that you're trying to build. So if you need a button, use a button. Um, the reason for that is because all of these semantic elements have accessibility features built into them. So um, just out of the box, I, so I, I mentioned uh, 
the W3C has all of these standards that they define, um, not just for web content accessibility for the people who are building websites, but also for the browser vendors. And those standards include things like um, basic accessibility functionality that is required for web browsers. Um, so that is uh, a web browser knows how to interact with a button to make sure that it has a bunch of uh, accessibility features baked in right out of the box. So when you have a button on your page that is coded as a semantic button, it is going to be keyboard focusable. It's going to respond to the standard set of keystrokes to, for activating it. A button has different states that are available and are passed to the browser and in turn are passed to assistive technologies. Um, same thing for form inputs that have like a required uh, 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 attribute and that is communicated to assistive technologies like screen readers. Um, there's just a lot baked in. And if you are using non-semantic elements to build things, you've got to recreate all of that stuff using JavaScript. That makes your code heavier. That makes your code more fragile. And it's just way more work for you. So don't do that. Make your life easier and use semantic HTML. And wherever possible, use the components from the design system as well, because that makes it even easier. Um, yeah. As you're writing your code, use ARIA, but only when you really, really have to, only when necessary. So if you're not familiar, ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And I'll read the definition here. It is a set of attributes that define ways to make web content and web applications, especially those developed with JavaScript, more accessible to people with disabilities. That is a mouthful. ARIA sort of bridges the gap between regular HTML and certain types of assistive technology. It's sort of the supplemental thing that you can add to your uh, HTML. So an example there would be, um, excuse me, an example would be if you have a, um, like some sort of a process that is uh, <clears throat> updating content on a web page. As the web page updates that content, the fact that things are changing isn't necessarily passed along to your screen reader users, um, but you can use ARIA to sort of flag certain regions of the page and tell the screen reader, hey, watch this spot because things might change here. And then whenever something changes in that spot, um, the uh, screen reader notifies the user about it. So that's an example of a use for ARIA. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a lot of the time you don't need it. If you, there's this tendency for engineers to over-engineer using ARIA. And um, when they do that, you either end up with, uh, again, like heavier, more fragile code, or you end up with experiences that are um, overly verbose for screen reader users or uh, are sort of non-standard experiences that break your mental model for interacting with the web page as a screen reader user. Um, you really don't need a lot of ARIA to make things work. So your homework for this, and I would definitely, definitely recommend this for every engineer, but it's a great read for anybody, um, is this article uh, by a former colleague of mine named Eric Bailey, ARIA is spackle, not rebar. So uh, the idea is that you would use ARIA to patch a hole in a wall, but you would never use ARIA to build a bridge. Um, it is a great article that sort of goes into the details of what ARIA is good for and what ARIA isn't good for. Um, but the main takeaway is it's important to use ARIA, but only use it when you really, really need to. Okay, one more for our engineers and for any QA people, um, <clears throat> use automated accessibility testing tools. Uh, so our tool of choice right now is called AxeCore. Um, this is from a company called uh, DQ. They have this whole suite of products called Axe. And we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Um, but in particular, uh, they have an open source accessibility testing engine called AxeCore. It's JavaScript, JavaScript library <clears throat> that hooks in really nicely to our uh, CID CD processes and um, and uh, I, I believe right now every time there's a pull request into the main branch for um, what gets deployed to VA.gov, 
I believe it goes through the X core uh, test suite. <clears throat> there uh, are also end-to-end -end tests that can um, call on the X core library. So um, there's some information on platform website. If you follow the link in the description section on those end-to-end -end tests to make sure that you're doing all of your automated testing to make sure that everything that can be detected with automated accessibility testing is detected. Um, you might wonder, how much can we detect with automated scripts? And the answer is like, depending on how you count it, like maybe a third of issues, um, which is both not nothing, definitely want to capture that third of issues, uh, but also not a substitute for humans. There has to be some human involvement along the way too. So definitely, definitely use automated accessibility testing. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> and then finally, test with screen readers. So I've mentioned before what a screen reader is, but I'll recap it again. A screen reader is a piece of software that converts text, buttons, images, and other page elements into speech. Um, it not just, or a screen reader won't just tell you what the text says, but it'll also communicate information about state um, uh, or um, what some of your options are when you encounter an element, things like that. So um, if I have tabbed into a form input, it will tell me if it's required. It will tell me what the current value of that input is. It will share the label that's associated with that input and sometimes other information that's associated too. Um, so screen readers are great, great tools. They are also not something that most people who are coming to work on va.gov have very much experience with. Um, so they can be a little intimidating, but I don't want you to be scared. <clears throat> uh, you do not need to be an expert screen reader user. I need to be an expert screen reader user. Um, all I want from you is to be familiar with screen readers. Try them out, sort of get a sense for how they work. One thing to remember here is that a lot of the veterans that we serve have recently acquired their disability, and they're not expert screen reader users either. They're still figuring things out. And so um, if that is reassuring to you at all, um, you know, you, you're in sort of the same boat as somebody who is trying out learning how to use a computer again for the first time uh, with a screen reader. Um, it's a it's a good experience, good exercise to go through to just try it out and experience a web page. Go to va.gov and try to navigate to some pages and, and you know, go to Gmail or Outlook and try to read your email with a screen reader. It's a good exercise. So some screen readers to try out. If you have a Mac, uh, VoiceOver is included with Mac OS. VoiceOver is the go-to Mac screen reader. Um, it's an Apple product, comes right with Mac OS. Nothing you need to do except turn it on. If you have a Windows machine, there is a free screen reader, open source screen reader called NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Assistant. Um, NVDA uh, is also the stock ticker symbol for uh, NVIDIA, the graphics card people. So um, as you're searching for NVDA, just make sure you put NVDA screen reader into Google so you don't end up in a very different place. <laughs> um, so NVDA is um, a free screen reader. Uh, that if you have admin privileges on your computer, you can install right away. JAWS, which is, uh, I'm blanking on what JAWS stands for, is an acronym. Everybody just calls it JAWS. JAWS is a paid screen reader. Uh, there's a pretty hefty license fee, but um, JAWS is the most popular screen reader uh, per um, market research. And I, I believe JAWS is the screen reader that the uh, veterans um, uh, rehab programs uh, teach newly blinded veterans. Um, yeah, yeah I, I believe they teach on JAWS. So a lot of our users will be using JAWS. Um, <clears throat> so JAWS is a paid screen reader. Um, if you can get your employer to pay for you to use JAWS, that is great. Um, I believe there is a license that is available on government issued, uh, government furnished equipment. Um, <clears throat> so if you have GFE, then you might be able to get JAWS for free um, or from the VA, I should say. Um, and then if you do not have GFE and you do not have admin privileges on your work computer, um, <clears throat> then there is a 
a screener called Narrator, which is included with Windows, just like how VoiceOver is included with Mac OS. Um, Narrator is not a popular screen reader for, <coughs> excuse me, for a variety of historical reasons, mainly. Um, it is a serviceable screen reader um, that um, experimenting with it and getting to know it will still be a useful exercise if you would like to try it out. Um, so that is your third option for um, a Windows screen reader as narrator. Uh, I would also encourage you to try on your mobile device if you can. Um, if you have an iOS device, there's a version of VoiceOver that's a little bit different than desktop VoiceOver included on your iOS device. If you have an Android device, there's a screen reader called TalkBack. So all of these are available in your accessibility settings on those devices. So um, what should you get out of testing with a screen reader? Uh, ideally, you should run through your product before you launch or before you bring it to me to review with a screen reader just to see if everything makes sense to you. Um, that is a tall order. That's a lot of work to test with a screen reader, especially if you're still learning. Um, so that is not a requirement that we have for VA backup teams, but it's a good idea. It's something that I would recommend you trying to do at least a few times to get a sense for the thing that you're building and the screen reader experience. But even if you don't do that, um, again, just trying out common web pages with a screen reader uh, can help you sort of understand what the interaction model looks like and what some of the uh, some of the things that are surprisingly easier using a screen reader and some things that are less easy when you're using a screen reader. So your homework, try a screen reader. Um, there are links in the description and for getting started with voiceover on Mac, getting started with NVDA on Windows. Okay, so those are many tools and techniques. But let's get down to requirements. What is it that you all have to do when you bring products through the collaboration cycle? And what that is, is foundational testing. That's what we call it. So what is foundational testing? Teams are required to complete and document their foundational tests before accessibility specialists, that's me, start a re staging review. This ensures that accessibility specialists can focus on advanced testing using desktop and mobile assistive technology. So in other words, um, we're asking you to do some testing for what you might call the low hanging fruit so that I can do the testing for the hard things and let you know what my findings are and what issues I find. Um, so there are a couple of links on this page, which again are on the slide rather, which again are in the description of the YouTube video. Um, I'll point out the section uh, on foundational testing, which is required for all teams, and then the advanced testing, which is recommended. Um, I will do all of these tests as I complete my review, but the more that you are able to do before you come to me for a staging review, <clears throat> the smoother my staging review is going to go. Um, if you can find every problem and I don't find anything, that's great. I love it when I don't have to do very much for my job. Um, and you'll love it too when you don't get tickets from me to go back and fix things. So uh, works out great for both of us. So uh, your homework for this slide is to read the prepare for an accessibility staging review article on the platform website. It goes into detail for all of these tests, what we look for. And for a bunch of them, there are um, uh, videos recorded by another accessibility specialist sort of walking you through the process for doing some of these tests. <clears throat> Um, as you complete these tests, we ask you to complete what's called the accessibility testing artifact. Um, so the testing artifact is a requirement, again, for staging reviews. So this is just how we document that you did the foundational testing that you needed to do. Um, the artifact also walks you through each of the foundational tests step by step. And I just want to note that anyone can complete these tests. It's not just for engineers. It's not just for QA people. Um, all of these tests are uh, completable using just a browser and a keyboard and a mouse. Um, you might need, I guess, okay, you will need for a couple of them some browser extensions, but those are easy to add. Um, and much like the accessibility annotations, the goal of the testing artifact is to facilitate conversation. Um, if you find things and you don't know how to fix them, 
document them in the testing artifact, we're not going to be mad. We're not going to be disappointed. It's going to be something that I can talk to you about when you come through for your staging review and I can help you. Um, the more information that you can pr provide to me in advance, the easier it is for me to help you all out. So your homework on this slide is to review the accessibility testing artifact on GitHub. It's a little GitHub template form thingy, um, walks you right through the testing process. And again, anybody can do these tests, um, take turns on your team, make everybody get involved. <clears throat> okay, so what are the actual tests? So for foundational testing, we ask you to do color contrast and color blindness tests. Uh, color contrast must be, <clears throat> excuse me, color contrast must be 4.5 to one for most text against a background and three to one for adjacent UI elements or for UI elements against a background. Uh, I apologize if you hear any noise in my background. My cats think it's time to eat and they are uh, letting me know. Okay, so color contrast test, meet those color contrast ratios. Um, there are tools uh, that are uh, available for testing that color contrast um, that spit out these ratios so you can check two different hex values and see if they have sufficient contrast. Uh, I believe some of those tools are linked to from the testing artifact and from the page on platform website. Um, one thing I'll note is that 4.5 to 1 and 3 to 1 are not a lot of contrast. So uh, black text on a white background is something like 20 to 1. That's sort of the most contrast that you can have. Um, so 4.5 4 to 1, 3 to 1, not a lot of contrast. Um, most color combinations in the design system are going to do better than that. But if you are doing something a little bit off book, something that is not in the design system, you might need to uh, double check, triple check those contrast ratios. <clears throat> The other thing we ask you to do for color is to check contrast and color blindness scenarios using tools um, that simulate uh, color blindness or um, uh, situations like that. So Sketch, Figma, and other tools have plugins. Um, Stark is a really good plugin. Uh, there are browser plugins like Colorblindly and also Axe Dev Tools has um, some contrast checks built in. We'll get to Axe Dev Tools in a little bit. And, uh, and then Chrome Dev Tools rendering options. So built into the Chrome browser, um, there are rendering options that help you simulate different color scenarios. Um, the main thing to check here is to make sure that there's nothing that's communicated using color alone. Um, you don't have anything where you say, click the green button to continue. And some people might not be able to identify which button is the green button. Um, and also to make sure that um, uh, in all of the different color contrast or in all of the different color blindness scenarios, uh, different elements are perceivable and distinguishable from each other. Uh, the next thing we ask you to do are content zoom tests. So zoom tests should be done with your browser and mobile devices whenever possible. Um, so uh, the way you do it in a desktop or a laptop with uh, with a browser is you set the browser to 1280 pixels wide. Um, and then you zoom in 200%, 300%, and 400%. That 12A number is coming from WCAG. It's like a normal size for a normal laptop, basically. Um, <clears throat> you can sort of eyeball it. Um, so 200%, 300%, 400%. Um, uh, and then at each of those zoom levels, page content should be usable without any horizontal scrolling. There are some horizontal scrolling exceptions. Um, those exceptions don't come up very often. If they do come up, I'll help you through them. Um, <clears throat> but basically, you shouldn't have to horizontally scroll. You shouldn't have anything that gets clipped off. You shouldn't have anything that um, that isn't usable at those high zoom levels. 400% um, doesn't give you a lot of screen real estate. I'll just tell you that. Like, as a designer, that's something you want to think about. You don't have to create wireframes and mockups for all of these uh, Zoom scenarios, but it's a good idea to sort of have a sense for um, what will this thing look like if text is really big and it's filling up a not very big space. You don't have a whole lot of screen real estate. Um, it's just a good thing designed for to, uh, to keep in mind. All right, and I've mentioned Axe Dev Tools. Um, so this is a product from a company called DQ. 
um, which is the same company, it's the same product as the AxeCore uh, testing engine that we use for automated testing for our CI CD processes and our end to end tests. So, Axe DevTools is a browser extension, it's available for free in Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. Um, <clears throat> there is a paid version. If you want to pay for it, that's great. Paid version is great, but just the free version uh, gives you everything you need for our requirements for foundational testing. Um, and what we ask you to do is uh, scan every page of the product that you're working on. Um, scan every page with Axe, and Axe will highlight anything that it can detect, any problems it can detect, and it will even give you extra information, link out to resources, and sometimes offer suggestions on how to fix the issue. Um, again, automated testing can only capture maybe about a third of, uh, of everything that might go wrong for accessibility, but that's still stuff that you're catching without having to do a manual code review. Um, it's a great product. I, I really love X. Um, and, uh, and in your foundational testing, we just ask you to share whatever you find. Sometimes you might get a positive result that is outside the scope of your product. Um, so that might be something in the header or the footer of VA.gov, something that we probably already know about and somebody's already trying to fix. But um, if you do uh, detect something like that, just let us know. Let us know if it's outside your scope. And um, and like I said, this testing artifact that documents all of your foundational testing, it's about conversation. It's about making sure that I know what you've been doing and you know what I'm looking for and uh, we're getting to know each other and helping each other out. Okay, the last thing that we ask you to do as part of the foundational testing <clears throat> is a keyboard navigation check. So this is just a spot check as you work through your product, make sure that everything that you have in your product, links, buttons, form elements, that everything that is interactive um, can receive keyboard focus and make sure that um, uh, it receives keyboard focus in an order that makes sense. Um, if you have a form that's asking first name, last name, date of birth, and the focus order is first name, date of birth, last name, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's going to trip people up. So um, what you do is you just press tab and work your way through the page. Tab, 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 tab. Make sure everything goes in the order that makes sense. Make sure everything receives keyboard focus. Uh, you should be able to tab forward and shift tab to go backward through the page. Um, and then <clears throat> as you do this, just think about like, is this a keyboard order that makes sense? Um, you shouldn't have to make your users do a lot of shift tabbing to go backwards. They should be able to just sort of move forward through the page. Um, if you're making your users press tab a lot to get from one thing to the next thing that they would care about, maybe that's a design issue. Maybe that's something where um, you can sort of rethink the order of things to move related things in closer proximity to each other. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of single page applications built with React. Make sure that when you um, press a button or um, you know some other action like that, um, focus goes somewhere that makes sense. So after you press that button, um, your keyboard focus should go to the next thing that is a sensible starting point for the next step in the task uh, that they're completing. And the next time they press tab, it should put them at the next interactive element in that um, in that workflow. So this is again just a spot check that you do. Uh, Check every page of the thing that you're working on. Make sure it all makes sense to you. All right. And that is foundational testing. Uh, you have made it through almost all of the accessibility orientation. I talk a lot. Um, thank you for sticking with me. I will not be offended if you change the YouTube playback speed to make it go faster, just as long as you paid attention to all the things I was saying. So let's talk about your homework. This is just a recap of all the things I told you you needed to do. Uh, the first is to review the VA.gov experience standards on platform website, uh, then join the accessibility help channel in Slack. Uh, if you are a researcher or in any way involved with research, you should join the inclusive research channel in Slack. You should read the article. This is especially designers, but it's useful for everybody. Read the article, Accessibility Annotations for VA.gov Applications. <clears throat> so this is um, 
how we annotate design work. Um, if you are a designer or a researcher or an engineer for that matter, you should read Accessible Prototyping with CodePen, which will be very useful for doing research. You should read Aria is Spackle, Not Rebar by Eric Bailey. This is the article about how we use Aria and when to use it and when not. Um, definitely, definitely every engineer should read this, but it's a great article, so everybody should just read it too. Everybody should read everybody, or everything, I should say. Yeah. Um, you should all try a screen reader. That uh, in, uh, This includes links for getting started with VoiceOver and getting started with NVDA. Uh, you should read Prepare for an Accessibility Staging Review on Platform Website. You should review the accessibility testing artifact on GitHub. <clears throat> and finally, you should install and use, for that matter, the Axe DevTools browser extension in your browser. And with that, you have actually reached the end of the accessibility orientation for VA.club platform. Um, thank you all so much for listening. I'm really looking forward to working with you. And um, if you have questions along the way, please visit me in the Accessibility Help channel in Slack. All right, thank you.